in a way that enforces privacy uh, via a cryptographic way uh, for every data and algorithm exchange. Um, you, you're probably wondering, why does that matter? Who needs it? Uh, why do I care? Um, so I will cheat and I'll do two quick slides given the technical nature of what we do. I found that it's often uh, helpful to have two slides to articulate the problem and the solution, and then I'll walk, go into a demo. So let's imagine on the right, again, uh, uh, I, I expect not to be quoted here, but let's say the B company here is Capital One and A company is Experian. Uh, we've seen that Capital One, uh, when when they when they expect to do a when they when they want to do a decision on whether or not I deserve a credit card, they receive my credit file from Capital One uh, from Experian. They receive it in a way that's secure and safe. But then when they operate upon it, they will decrypt it, generate a copy, a replica of the data exactly as it existed at source uh, under their systems, and then run their operations on it. Uh, that leads to all kinds of in unintentional and privacy-related uh, abuses and, and issues. Um, as an example, if these were in two different countries, uh, this may not be able to be done because of GDPR and other privacy um, uh, concerns around it, or, or um, the, <clears throat> the stray data laying around may then be breached, uh, leading to all kinds of regulatory and consumer privacy concerns. Um, the way we address that is we have uh, invented a new and novel kind of encryption. The beauty of that encryption is any kind of data, whether it's text, voice, video images, can be encrypted using essentially a one-way encryption. Uh, the novelty of that is to be, it is homomorphic-like, but about a trillion times faster than homomorphic encryption, literally, as you'll see it on the demo. Um, and the, the only purpose that the data can be used for is what was authorized. So as in, uh, if I set up Zach as my accountability partner and say, Zach, I'm going to send you my bank statement every month and you will monitor and keep me accountable to my ice cream spend, he will be obviously able to keep me accountable to my ice cream spend, but without gaining visibility to my mortgage spend or my uh, other information that's on the data. Um, the algorithms that are the operations done on the data may also be encrypted that would keep the intellectual property in them safe as well as the training data in them safe from reverse engineering attempts. So this is essentially a zero trust way to work with a vendor that enforces um, privacy regulation as uh, they exist. So we, this is not confidential compute in that the objective of doing this is not to keep your data secure from others that are potentially running on the same exact physical box. What I will show today is um, the, an example of uh, something that happened uh, on Kaggle is a customer transaction prediction. So the problem statement here is different banks have uh, have uh, data that they would like to be used to predict the next customer transaction. But the challenge with doing that is, first of all, if you did that um, using state-of-the-art tools today, the other banks, potentially even competitors, would learn about how uh, or what your data is. This may not be possible if, if one of the banks is not um, is, is subject to CCPA or GDPR. Um, and uh, even to do this challenge, what they did is generate synthetic data, which means they, there's an accuracy loss that, uh, that happened as a result of using this. So what I will show is how can real data to be used without needing to be anonymized in a way that predicts more accurately what, uh, what uh, a customer is likely to spend. Um, and I will train a deep neural network um, to make this prediction. So uh, to start out with uh, what triple blind, uh, I'll, I'll show you a, 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 what I am doing uh, in, in a graphical form and then do, do so in, a, uh, in the UI. I'm going to bring three data sets together in a way that maintains privacy from each other. Uh, these are actual customer data. Um, and then I will pre-process them even after they have been encrypted, which is uh, as anyone that's worked with data knows that data is never clean and precise and, and needs to be uh, needs to be pre-processed in a way that uh, does feature engineering cleanup and other data engineering items. I will then train a deep neural network here and then run predictions from the deep neural network on data I do not want to see. So uh, going back to my demo, um, I have three different browser windows, one on Microsoft Edge on Mac, believe it or not, the other one on Brave and the other one on Chrome, reflecting three different organizations that will um, uh, that have the, the data. Uh, and what I'm lo logging into is uh, the first organization. And here, as an example, uh, I can look at the different data sets that are available to me. Um, we, this is a demo environment, uh, so clearly there is a lot of a um, lot of different kinds of data sets. Uh, but let's just look at what one of them might uh, 
might entail. So I can see here from a data scientist perspective, uh, if I want to use this data set, what I might, uh, uh, what the data set is about, uh, if I want to use it, what the price might be, as well as exploratory data analysis. So I can get a view of the of the size, shape, layout, distribution uh, of the data in a way that does not violate the privacy of the individual elements of the data. So as you can see, I'm looking at plots and um, other uh, data elements that, um, that help me understand what I'm working with here. Now, um, the beauty of, uh, of triple blind is that you get to use actual data without any stochastic noise or any, uh, uh, unlike differential privacy or synthetic data or, or tokenization, you can use uh, the actual data elements in your, in your algorithms in a way that this is not revealed to, uh, to the user uh, or to a data scientist ever in the clear. So what I do at the beginning, uh, I've already run this step is pre-process data. Uh, what it does, it is goes to uh, Kaggle. Um, it has a Kaggle username and password and or token, uh, and it just downloads and positions the data in my uh, my environment. Now, um, uh, what I will show here is um, me taking the data, fetching it, uh, meaning I, I have a, an identifier that associates uh, this particular data set uh, with uh, my environment. Um, this is the asset.find data set, and I am mimicking three different banks bringing data together completely in a private way. So this is Santander Bank, JP Morgan Chase, uh, and this is intended to be BNP Paribas, but uh, we got the acronym wrong here. And then I, uh, in, in if, if any of you are AI scientists, this is a feed forward neural network that will start to predict or that will that is going to be trained on this data in a way that will predict the next likely transaction here, um, and I, I specify the architecture of the neural network here. I've got a, a dense layer ReLU as the activation function, um, and I've got um, the loss functions, and uh, this will uh, the the parameters for the um, the deep, deep neural network. I'm also I've also got a little bit of a pre-processing column here, and that I'm picking what the target job is. And then as I run this uh, script, as you will see, um, it first asks for uh, it finds the data set, and then it asks for permission from the other two providers of the data. So as in this example, I've got one of the three data sets, uh, but then as I go to my other uh, organizations. Uh, I will see that it has got an access request to access the JP Morgan data set, which I will approve. And then as I go to my third organization, um, it will ask me to approve the other data set as well. So now as permissions have been granted, uh, what this is doing is training uh, the, the deep neural network with a cryptographic consent obtained from each of the data owners. So this data has been encrypted and the only, and it's being used while it's being encrypted. And the only thing that that data may be used for is for the purposes of this training run. I had to provide a justification as to why I needed to do this. Um, and what it will output at the end of this is the trained object. Now the trained object is obviously a, a, a privacy preserving item. From there, you may not run any queries or any reverse engineering attempts uh, to try to um, reverse engineer any of the original chain training data sets. So as you can see, I've got a local model, local.pth. Um, this is likely going to not make any sense, but this is a PyTorch trained object, uh, which is my deep neural network that I can then use uh, uh, for running predictions from this, right? Uh, what I will do is first I will run a, a local inference. What that means is I am I, since I have the model downloaded, I am running it on uh, on data that I have locally on my system. So which means this is running uh, this aspect of the model or of the prediction where I've got my neural network and it is running predictions on data it never sees. Uh, the benefits of this, of course, are that. This is GDPR compliant, this is data residency compliant, and this is California Consumer Privacy Act compliant. Um, and the FDIC is starting to regulate uh, banks sharing data or financial institutions sharing data with, with uh, risky third parties. So this would comply with those regulations. I can then even uh, run what is called a secure multi-party compute uh, prediction uh, from this data set as well. Uh, what that means is I can keep both the algorithm hidden 
uh, from the data set and the, and the data hidden from the algorithm. Uh, typically, that is often used in healthcare where uh, you want to protect the algorithm from membership inference attacks, um, where, which would obviously reveal the result of the training run. Um, the, the, the beauty of this approach is, uh, is that you can use this with just pure and simple uh, PyTorch looking like code. Uh, any valid uh, pandas, uh, PyTorch and TensorFlow, and scikit-learn and XC boost code is valid triple blind code. Um, so it does not expect any uh, knowledge of the underlying fundamental cryptography that makes all of this uh, possible. And the big differentiators from the, the state of the art in this, in the, in the, in this space is that uh, it is fast, as you saw me train uh, a deep neural network uh, while on a live demo. Uh, this operation on homomorphically encrypted data would arguably take, uh, actually we've done it, it takes weeks, not minutes. Um, and I did it under, under a couple of minutes and then I can run predictions on it as you can see here uh, and get, um, and predict customer, um, uh, what, what transaction a customer is likely to make on encrypted data in a way that's real and feasible and practical. Uh, the difference between privacy as defined by triple blind and privacy as defined uh, by secure enclaves and other approaches is that we do not solve for confidential compute. The use case is not typically, I've got a machine here, uh, a physical box that I am sharing with uh, seven or eight other untrusted parties and I need to keep data uh, secure while it's being processed in that cloud virtual machine uh, versus the, the use case here is I am, uh, I am looking to make a better decision either because my first party data is biased or, uh, or because uh, I need to access data that resides in a different enterprise or, or a different company uh, locked behind privacy concerns. So you can use, uh, you would use this to reduce bias in your algorithms. You would use this to make more accurate predictions and to comply with regulations and, and uh, allow access to data or access data uh, in a completely safe and compliant way without any counterparty risk.